On behalf of all assembled here today, I should now like to invite our newest alumnus, Dr. Clark, to address convocation. Thank you, Carol, for uh, that great introduction. I'm, uh, I'm not sure I did all the things that you cited, but I'll take credit for them. Uh, it's a great honor to be part of this uh, convocation, and it's particularly for me uh, an honor to have John acting as Chancellor Emeritus. Uh, John was the chairman of the TD Board when TD bought Canada Trust, and in a sense was the person who hired me, and more importantly, was a great mentor to me uh, during our years together at TD, so that was fantastic. But this uh, ceremony uh, has a very, very special meaning for me because I was hooded by my brother. Professor Sam Clark. Now, Sam is really someone, you know, people always say, I've known them since birth. Well, I can truly say I've known Sam since birth, <laughs> since I'm the younger uh, of the brother. He's my older brother. And of course, uh, back then, uh, when he would hood me, it had quite a different meaning. Anyone that's had an older brother knows exactly what I'm talking about. But I couldn't be happier than to share this stage in honor with my brother. He's a person who's simple and deep values and incredible modesty, despite the fact that he is incredibly capable, it's been an inspiration to me for my entire life. Now, I'm just to set you at ease. I'm well aware of my role today. I know that I stand between you and you're getting your degree, and more importantly, getting out there and having a good party. So I will try to keep this short and to the point. And secondly, I also am very worried, and, and this year, this spring, has been fantastic. We've had quite a number of famous people, which I'm clearly not. And so my job is to try to say something a little interesting to entertain the graduates, families, and friends who are here, and then maybe say something relevant, but I'm perfectly aware that you're probably going to forget about it. So <laughs> important lesson is I've learned in these things is don't whatever you do, just don't talk about yourself. So first, let me start off. Congratulations. Uh, this is a great event. You are celebrating an investment in yourself. And you made that, and you made that decision to, because you had confidence in yourself and that the money would be well spent, and you believe that investment would pay dividends for you in the future. Now, the value of long-term investing that does pay dividends in the future makes a whole lot of sense to individuals. However, as societies, we're often collectively challenged to take the same view. In fact, I worry today that as a society we're struggling more and more to have the will to invest in our future in a way that would make a better world for ourselves and certainly for those that follow us. Before doing, getting into a little briefer discussion of this, I want to make, though, my clear bias about the world in which you're entering. I believe that the world today that you're entering is dramatically better than the world that I entered when I graduated 44 years ago. But it is a different world. And I get that you face big challenges. How are you going to get a job? How are you going to pay for your rent? And I'm going to come back to those. But I think if you'd step back and compare the worlds, you would say, yes, the world is dramatically better. We have massively raised the standards of living of billions of people. We have removed many oppressive regimes. Many more societies have semi-democracies or full democracies improving the freedoms for hundreds of millions of people around the world. We are a much more inclusive society. While there is much to be done, the role of women in Western societies has changed dramatically. Today, in the United States, we have a black president who supports gay marriage, something in my day people would have thought we would never see. We have changed access to knowledge. We are truly in the information revolution. And the internet is actually realizing its potential, making knowledge available almost anywhere to anyone, from the graduates in this room to youth stranded in refugee villages. But it is a different world. It's no longer a bipolar world with a single dominant economic and military power in the United States. The world is much more complicated with forces of evil more dispersed and the capacity to reach global consensus much more difficult. It's also a world where the growing incomes in the emerging economies 
are matched by growing inequality of incomes in the Western ones, a deeply troubling trend which risks changing fundamental aspects of our society. At the same time, we see the rise of the super rich in China and India, developments which reinforce the risk of crony capitalism in those societies. So let me return to why societies find it hard to invest in their long-term future. People invest, as you have done, because they believe in the outcome of the investment, and they are happy with how the benefits are distributed. The same is true at the societal level. People are willing to sacrifice their immediate, particular needs to obtain a better future for the general interests. Just look at what makes nations succeed. Who are the winners? And who are the winners, particularly in adverse times? And you will find it's the willingness of the people to come together with common interest and single purpose. And they do so because they have leaders that they will trust and follow. Yet there are examples today where we are clearly falling short. Take climate change. There's increasing consensus that the problem is real and the consequences are permanent, thereby placing a greater burden on future generations. But people do not necessarily believe leaders who describe the actual particular consequences for their country, nor do they trust their leaders to develop solutions that are necessarily effective. And they question whether the costs will be fairly distributed within their own countries and between countries. So the global response has been to punt the problem forward. Consider another example. Governments around the world are trying to find a balanced set of policies to get their economies on track. And while there are differences of view, most observers believe there is a set of optimal policies. Reform the tax system, adjust entitlement programs to make them more affordable, invest today in activities which improve productivity, such as education and infrastructure. But the politicians find it hard to implement such a package, because to do so would reduce the benefits to particular interest groups, in the case of tax and entitlement reforms, and the public resists increasing public expenditures because they believe the money will be wasted. So with both cases, we have a failure in leadership, and we take soft options knowing that in the future we will face ever harder options. Is it because our politicians today are worse than they used to be? It's not so clear to me. But the environment in which these politicians must operate has changed. In many cases, they have not. Today's environment makes them look less trustworthy and requires, indeed, a higher level of performance. Today, we're able to see every error, every foible. We know more about what's happening and what choices were made. We're also more aware that there are winners and losers in public policy decisions. And wider disparities in incomes make people more cynical as to whether there really is a common good. We're also more demanding of our moral standards. And this is a good thing. But we have to recognize that each scandal erodes public trust and makes it more difficult to get consensus behind solutions which meet the general good. So my plea to you would be, as you chart your own life, think what role you can play in the civic discussion. This is not a plea that you should enter politics, rather that you understand that public policy matters. The barriers to future increases in welfare in Western societies depend heavily on public policy, on improving the effectiveness of public institutions, and on finding better means of delivering public goods. The public sector matters more today than ever before, while trust in the public sector is lower than ever before. We need to raise the level of discourse and the standard of conduct. We must find leaders who will do the right thing, not the self-interested thing. We should reject politicians who hide, who avoid fact-based discussions, who like to attack their opponents rather than engage in debate about ideas and choices. There are no good soft options. We can find better hard choices if we as citizens participate. Now, I don't want you to leave today saying that I believe you should only be preoccupied with the redoing of public policy discourse, the nation. But I would say that as you travel ahead in life, it helps to have a view of what you want to feel 
when you look back, did I make a difference in a big way or in many, many small ways? Did I always do the right thing? Did I give back? Did I enjoy life and did I have fun? And most importantly, did I have meaningful relationships with people that matter? This often means, did I like my career? And here my message would be simple. Follow a career path which combines activities which you both enjoy and at which you are good. Pick where to work, not by what people will pay you, but the character of people with whom you will work. And in making career decisions, ask which jobs make you better, not better off. The one will lead to the other. Be prepared to face challenges, roadblocks throughout your career. Look at them as growth opportunities. They will test your mettle, but they will make you better. I, if anyone knows my career, know if I had had more than my share. And more than once thought, if I have one more growth opportunity, I'm going to be 11 feet tall. <laughs> but as investor guru Howard Marks says, experience is what you get when you don't get what you want. This leads to even a larger point. A positive attitude in life is critical. Life's just, just more enjoyable if the cup is seen as half full, and it lets you bounce back and learn. Indeed, it's your outlook and approach to life that I have found matters most. Very importantly, don't take yourself too seriously. The world is filled with people caught up in the me. It is a huge burden for them to carry, but it's, frankly, it's even worse for those of us who have to put up with them. <laughs> Finally, you will face enormous pressure to look good, be successful, get ahead, do all those things, but I can tell you that when you get to the end of the journey, those are not the things you're going to feel good about. That's why you have to always focus on the end game. And the end, what matters most is that your partner is still the love of your life, that your kids and grandkids come home regularly to visit, that your brother still wants to hood you in one way or the other, right? <laughs> that you have good friends, people you can trust and count on and that the big decisions you made in life were based on the right things. I am incredibly optimistic about the future because I see the future in front of me, you. Your full potential is ready to be unlocked and unleashed in the world. It's your time to make an impact, to leave an indelible mark on society that said, I made a difference. I wish you happiness and health along the way. Thank you very much.